Uh, we are at AWP 2017. I'm sitting with Terrence Hayes, who's the author most recently of a collection of poems called How to Be Drawn, which was a finalist for the National Book Award, and you won a National Book Award earlier as well, The Lighthead. Welcome, Thanks. first of all. Thanks, good to be here. Great to have you. Yeah, you should be comfortable. I want you to be relaxed. I heard you ask, sure. like, yeah, we're on a couch in the middle of AWP. Yeah, it's yeah, hard to be yeah. relaxed sometimes. It is, here. for me, certainly. Yeah. yeah, well, let's start with that a little bit. Uh, How to Be Drawn and, and your previous books have sort of elevated you to another sort of level of your profession as a mm. poet. You're, you're noticed now, you're six feet five, it's hard to miss you when you walk into to a place. Uh, how's that been for you as a poet? It's a little bit different now that you're noticed and, and recognized. Yeah, well, I mean, I've always been tall. And so I've all, and I, you know, I played sports, so people have always noticed me, but it's different when they notice you and they know you're a poet. Yeah. So that's, that's tricky. Um, I kind of prefer just to sort of be invisible. You know, Ken Kesey said it's hard to watch people when you're being watched. So I, I certainly find that to be true. Yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, it's, it's still poetry, so it's not a kind of, I'm not recognizing the airport, <laughs> although uh, my picture is in a couple of airports, but I don't, um, I don't mind it uh, when it's poets, I guess. When it's for poetry, I guess it's okay, which is just a small circle. Well, when you're carrying also um, sort of a new burdens now, I mean, yeah. the, the, a writer is often anonymous behind the scenes, taking notes, observing. Um, as, a, as a poet that's now reached a new level of fame in your business, as you mentioned, not in an airport necessarily, there's some responsibilities that come with that. People are asking you to sort of sometimes carry the idea of what it means to be a poet or to represent yeah. something. How do you feel about that and the idea of representing an idea or of having to um, communicate a larger idea than who you are even? Sure. I mean, I think poets write. So it's very difficult to be out even talking about poetry as opposed to talking about poems. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's one poem at a time. I try to work on like the last thing I wrote and the next thing I wrote. So even books for me aren't like a priority to tell you the truth by the time they're print it out. So maybe that's not great for my publisher sometimes that I'll, I'll give readings, I'll give one tonight and I won't read anything from the book, which means it's not something that you can sell. But for me, a poet writes poems, uh, not even really books, not even really poetry. I think a poet writes poems. So that's really what I concentrate on, the very particular exercise of writing a poem. Yeah, you told me you're working on American so a collection of American sonnets yes, now. Yes, yes. Tell me about that new project. Well, there's a poet who died in uh, 2014, I think she passed away, and she had written a series of poems, and they were just American sonnets in a sequence, and they spread out over her career. Her name was Wanda Coleman. And, you know, she was a, a friend and someone I greatly admired, and so I started writing these poems just after the election. And uh, since then, I've probably written about 60 or 70 maybe of them, and Maybe 20 of them are good, but it's a daily practice and it's a way to kind of deal with uh, the world right now. So all of my anxieties, all of my weird thoughts, sometimes they're very connected to like politics. Other times they're just connected to walking around the city. So I've just been working on those and uh, I haven't sent them out anywhere, but um, they keep me pretty obsessed and pretty occupied. So I will, I will try a few of those tonight. I love the immediacy of that. There's yeah. You know, one of the things about the writing profession is when something as uh, momentous happens as this ele recent election or, sure. or something else that sort of shakes a nation to its core mm -hmm. or changes uh, the direction of where we're going, right. writers will begin to write to that, but we don't see that work oftentimes for a year or two sure, years, sure. sometimes longer. And that would be usually my case as well. I, uh, I remember when Hurricane Katrina happened and I, I lived in New Orleans for a few years and people were putting together anthologies of what I said. It was like, well, you know, it'll take me a few years. So my Hurricane Katrina showed up in my 2011 book, you know. But with this scenario, because I'm sort of on a retreat, I'm, I have lots of time to write, I decided to really try it. I am a kind of obsessive reviser. I work on poems for years. So this is very different. I try to like do maybe one, sometimes two. The most I've done is three in one day. And I'm trying not to think of them as um, finished. It's partly why I haven't sent them out. You so. share them in other ways though? Uh, I, I try them at readings. So this is just for me, part of my process of writing. I do like to kind of put them in the air and see if I believe them. And so maybe after this, or maybe in a couple of months, I'll actually start thinking about them in, in print and online as places to send them. But presently, I'm just trying to write them and I'm trying not to think about uh, my typical habit of like revising, revising, revising. So. We'll see that maybe they're terrible. I don't know. I'll well, find out. <laughs> what is a, when you're um, when you're writing? What is the difference between the the feedback and feeling you get from a poem than when you're reading it? When you try them out and you hear that, it, some 
do you get yeah. something back from the audience or is it just the act sure. of like, it's presenting Sure, it's kind of, um, yeah, it's a live response, you know. So even silence means something for me or it's not necessarily applause. And it's also just my kind of revision process. I like to say, well, if I have to say it in, someone, in front of someone and I'm comfortable with it, then I think I believe it. So even that's a normal practice of writing a poem, trying it out, and then maybe editing it or, uh, or deciding not to read it at the last minute, which means it's not ready. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I've been shuffling through that. But that, for me, is a process. And finally, it just keeps me kind of vulnerable. Uh, I am a, you know, uh, my presence coming in the room is like very assured. But I do like to be, I like to sweat. I like to be a little nervous. So that is why I read new poems. It just keeps me a little bit more uh, alert, I yeah. think, as opposed to just reading from the book. I know how people are going to respond. I know what the popular stuff is. So it just, for me, it just makes the reading more present. It makes me more present. I want to talk a little bit about your uh, beginnings as a poet. Sure. Um, and, and Cave Can M, who is uh, mm. an organization that you started with as a young poet. Right. And you were working at the time with people like Tracy K. Smith and, and Elizabeth mm -hmm. Alexander and mm -hmm. this amazing group of people that you were surrounded by. Can you talk to me about the influence of that group on you and, and, and that family uh, that well, surrounded you? The founders, uh, Toy Derricotte and Cornelius Eady, they started it after, you know, spending some time together and thinking about what would be a kind of great organization for young black poets. And at the time, I just happened to be Toy's graduate assistant. I was a student at the University of Pittsburgh. And in some ways, I mean, I, it was just perfect for me because I had played basketball. I didn't really know poets. And so certainly I was one of those kinds of poets who was like, well, what is this space and the new world of like academics and graduate education? And so the great thing for me was that when they started it, I suddenly had a different understanding of what the poetry landscape was. And I've kind of grown up with that uh, accessibility to like, you know, not just black poets, but um, all kinds of rich histories of poetry and forms of poetry and the dynamics of, again, like, uh, is, one, is there one kind of like monolithic black poem? Not when you're in a room with like 40 black poets. You know, they'll be supportive, but they all have very different experiences of blackness. And so I try to carry that into my work. I try not to speak to kind of like big universals or big platitudes or big uh the sort of i say like not to say anything that's obvious is sort of my attitude and how the way i deal with my students but that comes out of kavi Khanum because i would say it to my, my my students when i taught there and i would say it to my friends and they would say it to me like we're trying to like do something new and so i still kind of carry that as a ambition as a poet to just not say anything obvious to uh be myself, be idiosyncratic, and not um, general, really. So yeah. how, are you, uh, how are you affiliated with Cave Canem today? Well, I was on the board for a few years. I'm off. Maybe I'll get back on uh, in a little while. But um, it's a family. I mean, I just know all of the people. I know the people who run in the office. Obviously, I'm still very close to Toy and Cornelius. And so, but that wouldn't, you know, that's not me. I mean, it is a kind of life time thing you get into it and it has an effect on you so just before i came in here i saw like three kabe kind of people from just over the years and so it's just the kind of thing where people maintain that the business part would be network but i think if there's something a little bit more intimate than that yeah yeah you, you've been in pittsburgh for a long time mm -hmm. um you were not originally from pittsburgh right. you were uh from the south and then yeah. moved here and in fact lived abroad as well sure. can you talk to me about the, the the regionality and the effect that it's had on you and your writing yeah, well, I mean, this is uh, maybe looping back to the first question. So Pittsburgh is great. There are lots of poets and everybody has been very supportive of my success from the mayor on down. And in fact, my picture is in the airport at Pittsburgh, which says something about how they care about poets. Yeah, and that's a kind of a great thing. However, I'm now in New York just for a visiting writer thing at NYU because I sort of had to get away. I mean, I, I just wanted to go somewhere I could work and not be... Uh, on Front Street, the way yeah. that I am. It's all love. I mean, they're very supportive, um, but it's certainly got to be overwhelming for me. So my response was like, oh, let me just uh, <laughs> go somewhere and write for a year. Yeah, you, you're uncomfortable yeah. with the idea of celebrityness. And, and yeah. in, a, in a town, I'm from Detroit, mm -hmm. we embrace our, any fame, you know, we, we sure. never forget where, you know, you've been here or lived sure, here sure. or yeah, spent yeah, some yeah. time there. Right. Pittsburgh seems like a similar city in that regard. They it embrace their celebrities to that degree. Yeah. Um, and that, that, maybe that's a strong word, but you seem uncomfortable with that, certainly. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, my main priority is just like, you know, writing and teaching. And so 
anything that kind of like slows that down, I usually get a little freaked out about because those are the things that kind of keep me <laughs> centered in my life. So yeah, but it's all love and it's not a kind of thing that I take for granted. I just, I have to write. So that means I have to kind of go somewhere where I can write and that's what I did. And I figured, oh, like maybe in a year or two, it'll settle down. And then the people who really, you know, maybe follow my work and are interested in that, I don't mind those people. It's just to sort of like, you know, when you're in the airport mm -hmm. or uh, people who sort of heard of you, that's what sort of makes me nervous as, you know, generally strangers would make me nervous. But when people show up and they're like, you know, they're familiar with the work and we talk about poetry, I could do that. That's pretty much all I can talk about <laughs> is poetry. So. Uh the last question that I have for you really involves your teaching and uh -huh. there's poetry students and there's people who are interested in poetry and, sure. and the structure of poetry and form and mm -hmm. certainly you play around a lot with form. Yeah. But then there's people who approach you and that the, some of the, the, the puzzle like forms that you introduce sure. and things like that might be a sort of above their heads, but they're interested in the word and, and the spoken word and the idea of, of moving someone through words right. um, on an everyday level. Do you also work with, uh, you know, students who are new to poetry as well? Yeah, that's the great thing about conferences. Uh, I just did a conference in Florida and most of these, it was in January. So many of the people were senior, seniors, the kind of people who could like take a week long workshop. So, but they were new to it and they were super enthusiastic. There was, there were some younger poets in the group too, but that's just a, such a different dynamic than, um, you know, professionals. We do need people who are committed to poetry, which are grad students and who, teach and understand some of the history, but it's also great just to get like regular people to write poems. So, and I do, I, I like, again, I like sweat, I like emotion, I like passion. So with those kinds of folks who are just sort of, you know, uh, weekend poets, I do like to push them into new spaces. Sometimes it's about forms. Sometimes it's about like writing about difficult subjects or not writing about them even, like writing about it without writing about it. So, but those lead to really interesting kind of surprising moments. It's true for high school kids too. So whenever you can get somebody who maybe hasn't had a kind of intense or passionate relationship around poetry, that's sort of what I, I aim for. So yeah. I aim for it in graduate teaching too. It's just that it's so regular. You can't have people breaking down and crying every week, but <laughs> you know, I do aim for a kind of intensity yeah. in the workshop. Yeah. You, you told us earlier that it's about, for you, it's about the individual poems, yeah. not necessarily about the collections. I'm sure your publishers are like, we like the collections part, but for those readers who, that's how they'll sometimes find your work. Sure. Um, when do you plan on compiling some of those poems that you're working on now and, and uh, looking I, forward? I don't know. I mean, uh, Behrman wrote the dream songs. He published the 77 version, and, but he wrote like over 300 of them. So I'm thinking, oh, that's not bad. Maybe I could just push up to 300 and cut back to 77. So I am just trying to like, you know, go forward and it is how I cope. These, this particular little box of the sonnet, which is what's great about the sonnet, it is how I'm coping right now with just being, you know, in America. So I'm just putting everything in it. And so I don't know because I don't really know, I, that'll be the distance that I'll need. It'll take me a minute to really decide. Uh, I mean, if I was forced, if you said, you must publish them now, I probably would say, oh, I got three, <laughs> even though I've written about 60, but <laughs> maybe there are others that are good, but I'm trying just to kind of like muscle through it and find out what it is I'm doing now. So I don't know when they'll be in a book. All right, well, yeah. we'll look forward to that, Terrence Hayes. Thank you, thank so you. So nice for you to be here. Really appreciate yeah, yeah. you making the effort to come on to our set.